the problem of scrambling is if you have a complicated system, let's say in thermal equilibrium, and you perturb it, how does the information of the perturbation, you flick it, how does the information of the perturbation spread itself out through the system? How long does it take for it to get lost in all the degrees of freedom? How, can, how, how long can you track it and so forth? Scrambling is the process of information being spread throughout a system so as eventually to become lost in the many, many degrees of freedom. It's also called chaos. It's also called uh, thermalization or rethermalization and so forth. What we imagine is that there's a system which has a Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian could be a Hamiltonian for a system of qubits, a system of spins. And we'll assume only that the Hamiltonian is a sum of pairwise terms. Every particle interacts with every other particle. It may or may not interact with every other particle, but at most it interacts in the Hamiltonian, let's say, with one other particle. So pairwise interactions. An example, again, would be a spin lattice in which every particle interacts with its neighbor. Well, with its two neighbors on each, si on each side. If it was higher dimensional, each particle might interact with three or four or five. That, that's OK. It doesn't matter. For systems like this, it's pretty clear how long it takes information to spread through the system. If you perturb one of these and it's in thermal equilibrium, it'll kick the next one, it'll kick the next one, it'll kick the next one. And the signal will propagate through the system in what's called ballistically with some kind of velocity. The velocity is called the butterfly velocity for butterfly effect. Uh, and uh, it'll take a time, which is, uh, it'll take a time which is linear in the distance or in linear in the size of the system. That's scrambling for a system like, uh, like this. There are other systems where these terms in the Hamiltonian connect every pair of particles. Every pair of degrees of freedom is connected. An example that might be something like this would be a large, very complex molecule where everything is jammed together enough so that everybody couples to everybody else. But again, with pairwise interactions, this is a large complex molecule. This is a spin chain. All right. The large complex molecule thermalizes or scrambles much faster than the spin lattice. And I'm going to give you a model for how it scrambles. Here's the way it works. Imagine in this room here that somebody has some black ink on their hand. Now, we're going to play the following game. Every 10 seconds, we blindfold everybody. Every 10 seconds, we mill around like mad, and everybody finds a partner and shakes hands with them. And then we do it again. Every 10 seconds, they mill around and um, shake hands again. How many people, after n time steps, will have been infected with the black ink that Pierre originally had on his hand? Well, the answer is clearly exponentially growing. Incidentally, this is the same mathematics of the way that, um, uh, that the contagions spread. After one step, Pierre and his partner will be affected, the partner that he shook hands with. After two steps, each one of them will infect two other people. The infection will grow exponentially, but this is assuming that anybody can interact with anybody else. If we just had a long chain of people, each one can only interact with his neighbor, it would spread much more slowly. So after n time, or after t time steps, the number of infected people is 2 to the t. Well, how long does it take to affect everybody in the room? If the number of people in the room is n, then we take the logarithm of both sides. The time that it takes to infect everybody, that's called t star, it's a standard terminology, is, forget this fact of 1 over t here, just logarithm of n, log to the base 2 of n. Now, what is 1 over t doing there? Well, what is the rate at which people interact? Obviously, the temperature. If the temperature was 0, everybody would be too cold to move around, right? As the temperature goes up, people get more energized. As the temperature gets very high, they move around like mad. So the, there is a rate here. The rate is the temperature, the time that it takes for everybody to get infected is 1 over the temperature times the logarithm of the number of degrees of freedom. And the number of degrees of freedom for a system like this is proportional to its entropy. 
S is entropy. Now, if you don't follow all of this, it's not terribly important. The point is that it's logarithmic in the size of the system with a coefficient, which is the temperature. This is called sc fast scrambling. This is called fast scrambling, and it's what you expect for this kind of large molecule. This is called slow scrambling. There was a conjecture. The conjecture was originally due some combination of Hayden and Preskill, and myself and, uh, and uh, Sakino. And the conjecture had two parts. It went as follows. No physical system can scramble faster than the contagion model, than the shaking hands model. No physical system can scramble faster than this. The fastest, that it, the shortest time that it can take to completely scramble a system of s degrees of freedom is 1 over t times log s. That was a conjecture. Okay. Now, the second part of the conjecture is that black holes do scramble this fast. Black holes, when something falls onto them, smear out their information at that rate. Okay. These were conjectures. They're not new conjectures. They're, I don't know, five, six, seven years old. I don't remember. But very recently, in a pair of really remarkable papers, these conjectures have been proved. Conjecture two was, in fact, in a sense, the first to be proved. It was proved by Schenker, our own Steve Schenker, and Douglas Stanford that black holes are fast scramblers and that they scramble in such a time scale. Okay. And then, number one, that that is an absolute bound. Now, the coefficient here, I haven't written down the numerical coefficient. There is a numerical coefficient, and they found it. No physical system can scramble faster than that. That they proved from an assum you know, the assumptions that went into it, but the assumptions are very plausible. And so this fast scrambling conjecture has now been proved. I have just a couple of minutes uh, to tell you how it was proved, uh, <coughs> part of it how it was proved, how they proved that black holes are fast scramblers. So I'll jump now. For those who don't know general relativity, you just have to close your eyes and uh, bear with it. For those who do, they recognize these as Penrose diagrams, they're pictures of black holes. I won't explain them. I'm not going to explain them at all. This is a black hole in anti de Sitter space. The yellow region here is behind the horizon. The white regions out here are in front of the horizon. And you know, some of you know this picture. This picture here is an, this is anti de Sitter space with a black hole, or actually a pair of entangled black holes connected through a wormhole in the center. And this is the region behind the horizon, the yellow region. Here is roughly, now I'm paraphrasing. I'm paraphrasing what's, uh, what Schenker and uh, Stanford did, but it goes something like this. They said, perturb the system a tiny little bit. Oh, incidentally, the boundaries of the anti de Sitter space are these vertical lines here. This is the boundary in space-time. These are the boundaries. This is the bulk. These are the singularities, for whatever it's worth. They said, imagine going back into the past, deep into the past, and perturbing the black hole. A little perturbation, a little butterfly perturbation. A butterfly waves its wings at the black hole and makes a <coughs> tiny perturbation over here. That tiny perturbation will evolve as time goes on into a two ways to think about it. If you think about it from the point of view of the boundary quantum field theory, it's just chaos. Oh, I mean chaos. By, by chaos, I mean chaos. The butterfly waves its wings. That affects some neighboring molecules. The neighboring molecules affect other neighboring molecules, affect other neighboring molecules. And whatever the state of the system would have done, it sort of exponentially departs and goes off to some other state. It's got to do with why a little butterfly can wave its wing and affect the, the, uh, the weather 2,000 years from now. All right, so that was the picture on the boundary. But there was a much easier picture to deal with, and that, in you, that used the bulk geometry. And in the bulk geometry, what they found is this little perturbation, blue shifts, blue shifts and becomes a powerful shock wave that goes through the interior geometry. 
a powerful shock wave which is much easier to calculate than trying to track the chaotic behavior of the boundary theory. Here is, again, I'm paraphrasing. What they found, what some combination of a few of us found, is that the scrambling phenomenon, the, the phenomenon that the system has spread its information out over the whole thing, that time scale is exactly the same as the time scale for the shock wave to reach within a Planckian distance of the horizon. It comes in and it goes back out. And this is easy to calculate. Just a little bit of general relativity will allow you to calculate how long it takes for the shock wave to get within a Planckian distance of the horizon. And the answer was, here it is, right here, essentially exactly the same as the conjectured bound on scrambling time. What they provided was also a numerical coefficient, the 1 over 2 pi, which is very, very precise. This was done by Maldacena, Schenker, and Stanford, several different papers, and also something very similar by the, uh, by the, um, by Kitaev, by Alexei Kitaev. So this essentially proved that black holes are fast scramblers. They were also able to prove that nothing can scramble faster than that. Some of these ideas are testable. They're testable in the laboratory. Why? Because quantum mechanical systems, large quantum mechanical systems of atoms can be built. They can be caused to interact rather strongly. Remember what I said in the first place, that there are now believed to be dualities connecting strongly interacting large systems with gravity problems. And you can't test gravity. That's too hard to test. But you can use gravity to calculate and then test in the laboratory how fast various kinds of scrambling phenomena happen. Monica and Brian designed an experiment. Uh, Brian's experiment was based very much on the work of, um, of Maldacena, Schenker, and Stanford. And they think they can really do the experiment, effectively on what is a cold atom system representing sort of a large molecule with everybody interacting with everybody else, perturb it, and ask what happens to it. So some of these things can be checked. This is very interesting. I don't think, they'll, I don't think they expect to find any great surprises. It, of course, would be um, very surprising if they violated the bound and found that scrambling took place faster. Probably that won't happen. Um, but I think I'll leave it at that. I will not try to get into complexity, which is my own interest in this subject. But uh, complexity theory is beginning to play a central role in the understanding of the growth of the interior of black holes.